on to this morning's big uh, keynote. Some of you will know that uh, we invited Shirley, to, Shirley Williams to come and, and give a talk uh, very early on. I think it was the, the first uh, of our Rest is Noise sessions. And even I, who've been a long-standing fan of hers, was agog with the realization that her knowledge of politics and her knowledge of culture is second to none of, well, certainly nobody I've ever met. Um, and uh, she took Alex Ross on, and he, you know, he's no mean feat to do that with, and he, he, he concurred that, yes, she was more of an expert than he was on many things. He gave in. Um, and uh, so we invited her back sort of for every weekend since. Um, and it's, it served us very well because she really can span a century, not just because of her own life, both as a politician, as a journalist, as a cultural commentator, but also the life of her mother, Vera Britton, um, who led a very, very rich political and cultural life and was a great friend of Benjamin Britten's. And indeed, they toured together, um, uh, raising money for a, a project which Shirley will talk about later. I don't want to spend an awful lot of time introducing Shirley because she is such a, 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 an international figure. But I do want to say that uh, in 2007, Gordon Brown appointed her as an advisor on nuclear proliferation. And she's the only British member of the board of the Nuclear Threat Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, she is Professor Emeritus of Elective Politics at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and is getting on a plane tomorrow at 7.30 to go to America. Uh, she's the author of several books, Politics is for People, A Job to Live, and God and Caesar. But if you haven't read her autobiography, Climbing the Bookshelves, do. Again, really revelatory in, in all kinds of ways. Um, and she's, on question time, undoubtedly one of the, the sane, knowledgeable voices that makes you understand that a life in politics can be both ethical, purposeful, and leave a lasting legacy. She will do all of those things. So we're looking forward to hearing her talk. She's going to talk for about half an hour, and then I'll, I will ask some questions, and then hopefully you will ask some, some questions. So can we welcome Shirley Williams? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And... Uh, just pray for me that the computer will work. It doesn't always, but we'll do our best. As the 19th century empires collapsed, retreated, or lost confidence in their imperial mission in the aftermath of the First World War, revolutionary ideologies and new movements in music and in the arts gained ground. The post-war generation of young people turned away from the suffocating and restricting conventions of the European classical tradition, symbolized by the city of Darmstadt. Darmstadt and its musical institutions had become a dominant force in classical music, and many, many of the new works were tested against Darmstadt's very severe traditions and largely failed them. The city of Darmstadt had very little to say about innovation and experiment, but in politics, young people in the interwar years were very much attracted by the politics of the left and even of revolution. Russia, which had for centuries, of course, been led by Tsars, who were given, in effect, a semi-divine status by the Orthodox Church, and this you will be familiar with from your knowledge of opera, of course crumbled into civil war and then into the victory of the communist revolutionaries. The Ottoman Empire disintegrated into a whole set of different little states, and they were often very weak ones, and to this day are still the source of a great deal of instability in the Middle East. In Western Europe, the political class in Britain, France, Italy, and Spain began to concede some of their power reluctantly to the public, and in particular, in some cases, allowed women to have the vote, and in other cases, extended the franchise to people with no property or very little. The economic system, however, in the interwar years, remained based on markets, albeit often protected in the national interest. Armageddon for these economies was not the First World War, but the collapse of the heart of the financial empire 
in Wall Street, 1929, the time of the Great Crash. As the dole queues lengthened across the Western world and beyond, the short-lived euphoria of the post-war world gave way to gloom, even to despair. People grasped at the polluted promises of fascism, Nazism, and for that matter, of nationalism, or of revolutions that in the words of, hope for me, Jacques Mali Dupont, revolutions that devour their own children. It was the case then that the two decades following the First World War were the background in Britain to a new generation of gifted young composers growing to maturity. The gramophone and the radio enabled them to hear not only the classical masterpieces, but also modern European works, including 12-tone and 8-tonal compositions. And the sounds of the new world, from vibrant Broadway musicals to Afro-American blues and traditional spirituals. Highly critical were the flaccid and often sentimental products of established British composers at the time. Young men like Michael Tippett, hello Michael, and like Benjamin Britten, uh, were in fact brought up and looking out for innovation and new ideas, but not looking in Britain for that. The English musical scene between the wars was dominated by popular regional composers like Ralph Vaughan Williams and William Walton, drawing on a tradition of folk song, folk song, love of countryside, and nostalgia for a fading patriotic past. It was and is a tradition with great popular appeal to this very day, as any of you who follow very closely the proms will know. But it's also true that the uh, lark ascending, Vaughan Williams' famous song, remains one of the best-loved compositions among English audiences. But among international music critics, English music was dismissed as the amateur work of a small country, along with that of Scandinavia and Eastern Europe. Britain discovered Schoenberg, the most influential of the post-war modern composers, when listening to a BBC radio programme in 1930. The influence of the BBC, which launched the symphony orchestra in the same year, and the LPO two years later, cannot be overstated. It was so far-reaching, it, it introduced both Britain and Michael Tippett and other young composers, not only to national, but even to international audiences. It was the midwife of the English musical renaissance. England had long been regarded on the continent of Europe as the land without music. Composers as substantial as Edward Elgar were dismissed as parochial or conventional. Little was known or appreciated about Tudor or Jacobean music. I remember when I was a Fulbright scholar at Columbia University in the 1950s, asking a Belgian friend, a man reputed to be deeply knowledgeable about music, if he'd, what he thought of Henry Purcell. His answer was quite straightforward. He had never heard of him. Purcell was, for Britain and others, key to the revival of English music. He had meticulously matched music he composed, for instance, in his operas The Fairy Queen and Dido and Aeneas, with the language of the libretto. Britain enthused over him. I quote, words set, he said, with such ingenuity and colour. He summed up his own purposes. One of my chief aims, he wrote, is to try and restore to the musical setting of the English language a brilliance, freedom and vitality that have been curiously rare since the days of Purcell. English is a rich, various and beautiful language, as its literature and poetry in particular attest. But it is not easy to set to music. Britain was a voracious reader of poetry. He rarely travelled anywhere without a book of poetry in his pocket. George Crabbe's great epic, The Borough, which uh, was found by Britain in a California bookshop, the story on which Britain's Peter Grimes, as, as you know, was based, entranced Britain and I think fed his sense of homesickness about the county that he so loved. The composer brought together the arts he loved best, music and poetry. During his life, he set 315 poems to music, 90 of them by known poets, the others by anonymous authors lost to time or buried in folk memory. 
Among his song cycles, he included the holy sonnets of John Donne and some of Shakespeare's sonnets, poetry of subtlety and complexity, hugely difficult to translate into a musical setting. While Britain was not active in politics before the cataclysm of the Spanish War, he and Tippett had been pacifists from their childhood. Tippett had been brought up by a suffragette mother, whose passion for the women's cause was so strong that he took her to prison for several months. The young man shared his mother's convictions and himself went to Wormwood Scrubs prison in 1940, rather than accept the non-combatant alternative proposed by the appeal court that was considering his case as a conscientious objector. Britain's pacifism was so strong, some critics described it as aggressive, owing much to his association with his great teacher, Frank Bridge. And also, he owed to Frank Bridge much of his basic socialism. Fired by the enthusiasm of his friend Aaron Copland for the freedom and virtuosity of the new world, and keen to escape from his complicated relationship with the young man Wolfgang Scherzen, Britain, in 19, the spring of 1940, decided to travel to the United States with his new friend Peter Piers, with a view to settling there. That's important to realize, that was his intention. As a keen pacifist, he was vulnerable to the charge of cowardice. Some of his many critics were not slow to make that charge. He returned in July, January 1942, when the war was at its height, risking the perils of transatlantic crossing. He had come to dislike the bohemian life of young activists and young writers in New York, and had discovered how deeply his roots were planted in Suffolk soil. He never again lived for any length of time anywhere else. In the United States, Britain had learned how central to his whole being was life in the austere, seager world of Suffolk. The country, and here's a nice picture of it, had rich and abundant fields, and it was, of course, a place where many artists flourished. It was also true that um, for Britain, the lovely churches of the county were also very important. He performed many of his works in Blytheborough Church, which is fairly near to Aldborough. But perhaps most important of all for him was not only the world of Suffolk, but the fact that he'd been in love with his childhood there with memories of his beloved mother, Edith, with his sisters, Barbara and Beth, with the haunting sounds of seagulls and curlews, the reeds, and above all, the ever-present restless sea, which at Dunwich had devoured a whole medieval village, and in Aldborough became the place in which Britain chose to live. He was a man prey to moodiness and depression, but he returned, returned frequently, indeed began to live, in the haven that he'd made for himself. His dominating friend and mentor, the poet Winston Hugh Auden, saw one of his tasks in America as being to confront Britain with his homosexuality, to compel him to grow up into the complexities, cruelties, and pain of the adult world. His farewell letter, given to Britain shortly before Ben returned to England in January 1942, was unsparing, I quote. You see, Benji, dear, you are always tempted to make things too easy to yourself. This way, to build yourself a warm nest of love, of course. When you get it, you find it very stifling. And to be playing the lovable, talented, talented little boy. The war touched Britain in other ways. Despite the country's impoverished and rationed lifestyle, the challenge of reconstruction and renewal proved transformational. The new Labour government accorded a central place to the arts following the wartime work of the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts. It embarked on the project of building a great new concert hall, as all of you will know, a national gallery, and indeed a national theater. The Royal Festival Hall was opened in 1951, and up and down the country, the arts were encouraged. The new mood spilled over into the British-occupied zone of Germany. In his book, Alex Ross has brilliantly described the encouragement of music in the American zone. Despite the lack of resources, the managers of the British zone proved bold and imaginative too. That was particularly true and notable when Frank Packenham, Lord Longford, pictured here, became the minister responsible for the British zone of Germany. British writers, artists and musicians 
including some who had been pacifists and others who had been opponents of Britain's peacetime uh, policies, sorry, wartime policies, were invited to lecture and discuss their ideas. Amongst them were my parents, both of them on the Gestapo blacklist, and the rising young pacifist composer, Benjamin Britten. In July 1945, as the war ended, Britain accompanied the great Jewish pianist Yehudi Menuhin to perform at the concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen, just liberated by Canadian and British troops. The terrible experience of encountering Belsen's victims, many of them starving and dying, scarred Britain with a lasting awareness of evil, of man's cruelty to man. He spoke little of his experience, but it undoubtedly influenced his work for the rest of his life. It also reinforced his convictions and his active involvement in the pacifist movement. He became a member of the Peace Pledge Union and later its president, remaining close to movement until his death in 1977. Alex Ross makes light of Britain's political activities, but they were more significant than the rest his noise suggests. Britain accompanied my mother, the writer Vera Britain, also a passionate pacifist, in a series of concerts and readings around the country to raise money for starving children in Europe affected by Britain's naval blockade. My mother wrote a pamphlet called One of These Little Ones and read from her books. Meanwhile, Britain himself played the piano and played often his own compositions. Um, and that, that, that set of concerts went on right up until July 1945, the end of the war in Europe, after two and a half years of campaigning and scores of meetings and concerts the food relief campaign ended with a farewell concert at the Guildhall School of Music on the July the 20th, 1945, addressed by Michael Tippett and my mother and played by Peter Piers and Benjamin Britten. Alex Ross deplores in The Rest is Noise the harassing of left-wing composers like Aaron Copland during the notorious 1950s period when Senator McCarthy and his associates denounced any young artists or anybody else who appeared to be to have communist or socialist sympathies. There was, however, a significant distinction, which Ross doesn't catch, between Britain and American attitudes at the time. British artists and musicians, many of whom indeed harboured such sentiments, suffered no serious opprobrium for their views. For the British public, Uncle Joe was still a friendly figure. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, British government remained stubbornly determined to reject any military involvement in the Vietnamese War. But British musicians, in particular Britain and Pears, did not escape calumny. There was a, a toxic mixture of professional jealousy and homophobia in the musical establishment, which exploded after the calamity of the open night of Glaliana, which was, of course, in 1953, to celebrate the coronation of the young queen Elizabeth II. The opera itself was vulnerable to criticism. Based as it was on the declining years of Queen Elizabeth I and her rather puzzling relationship with the Earl of Essex, it was, exact, it was not exactly appropriate to the joyous mood of the public at the time. But much of the criticism was bigoted, including veiled and sometimes unveiled diatribes against the influence of homosexuals in music and the arts. The Britain pairs relationship was cited, although Britain's own behaviour, despite his idealised attention and attraction to young boys, was actually marked by extraordinary levels of self-disciplined constraint. He was, in some ways, a conventionally respectable figure. But he was also a brilliant, innovative and adventurous composer. He was fortunate in working for a public body that recognised and appreciated these qualities. On the 14th of November, 1940, one of the Luftwaffe air, rides, air raids directed at the English heritage, the so-called Baedeker raids, devastated the Midland city of Coventry and destroyed its fine medieval cathedral. According to Alex Ross and the rest is noise, the air, rest was, the air raid was called by its perpetrators the Moonlight Sonata. After the war, Coventry established a committee to rebuild the ruined cathedral. The committee proved to be inspirational. It decided not to clear the ruins of the old cathedral, but to build a new one alongside it as a lasting memorial to the costs of war. It invited Basil Spence, at that time one of Britain's leading modern architects, to design it. 
It approved outstanding and sometimes controversial artists to, um, to emblazon the interior, such as John Piper and Graham Sutherland, whose tapestry, Christ in Majesty, was a modern declaration of his ultimate victory. To celebrate the consecration of this remarkable renaissance, the committee invited Benjamin Britten to write an appropriate piece of music and then gave the composer complete freedom to choose what form of music he wanted to make, whether sacred or secular, whether choral or orchestral. Relishing this freedom, Britten proposed to produce the War Requiem, blending the words of the Latin Requiem Mass and the poems of the great and ruthlessly truthful war poet Wilfred Owen, with music moving from the lyrical to the shattering. Britain's good friend Dmitry Shostakovich paid the work its finest tribute. It is, he said, quotes, one of the great works of the human spirit. Michael Tippett was more specific. It is, he said, the one musical masterwork we possess with overt pacifist meanings. <laughs> The War Requiem, performed throughout the world, established Britain as a great international composer. It coincided with the slide into a new war, the Vietnam War, as terrible in its own way as the Second World War. It was a war that aroused passionate protest within the country that waged it, the United States. The products of Britain's middle and later years were widely admired. Billy Budd, Turn of the Screw, the lovely adaptation of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, Death in Venice, the song cycles and concertos. His output was so prodigious that it tended to eclipse his contemporaries like Michael Tippett, himself a complex, challenging, and brilliant composer. Between them, Britain and Tippett re-established Henry Purcell's canon, canon of music that embraced and complemented the poetry and the literature of the English language. These islands were no longer a small country, nor a parochial backwater. After three centuries, British music had come back into its own. Thank you. That's the end. Thank you, Shelley. Um, Actually, your references to Michael Tippett throughout that and the, and the photograph that's behind us made me think about how generous Michael Tippett always was. You know, there's a famous theory which is that Ben Jonson would have been Shakespeare if Shakespeare hadn't lived. In other words, Ben Jonson was a fantastic playwright, but not as fantastic as Shakespeare. Um, and this relationship between Tippett and Britain and then Britain's kind of luminosity on the, on the musical scene. Uh, do you think that in some way has meant that Michael Tippett has been left less appreciated than he might have been? Yes, I do. I also think that, he, that um, Tippett suffered to some extent from timing. I mean, his, his, his great work, Child of Our Time, a bit more technical from, his great work, Child of Our Time, um, which was in many ways, of course, a great pacifist work, uh, came out in a way too early. Um, he wrote it and it produced it in 1945, I think I'm right in saying, and it was too soon after the end of the war. Um, Tippett's, but, but Tippett, in a sense, caught the departing tide after the war had, come, had finished, and it wasn't a time which was yet ready for what he had to say. In the case of Britain, the war requiem was perfectly timed. It came at the point that when another war was emerging, it came at a point when people had had time to absorb the Second World War, to think it through it, to work out what they thought about it. Um, and I think, therefore, that Tippett really did suffer from being too soon. Now, it's true that he'd thought a great deal in prison, and he was in prison for several months as a conscientious objector. Tippett had thought a great deal about the work he was working on. In fact, he probably drafted, I think I'm right in saying, most of the child of our time while he was in Wilmot Scrubs. Um, and I suppose what he wanted when he got out was to somehow be part of the new freedom that came to him when the war ended. But if he'd waited for four or five years, he probably would have had a much better reception and the critics would have been much more ready uh, to look at his work, which was essentially a work about the coming of peace. So I do think that that was probably true. I also, the other thing about Tippett, as you say, he was colossally generous. He was not least very generous to uh, Benjamin Britten. You may remember that when Britten died, Tippett said of him that he was, I think, 
the most purely musical spirit he'd ever met. Um, and he went on being, he lived a long life, Tippett, but in a way, by the time you got to the 1960s and 70s, Britain was the dominant force, partly because of his operas, because he was so prodigiously productive, uh, and because things like the War Requiem, and even to some extent Billy Budd and Peter Grimes, seized the public imagination. Now, in the case again of Britain, I think particularly Peter Grimes, but also the War Requiem, launched him into an international, uh, market's the wrong word, an international sphere. Tippett never quite jumped that far. Um, I think his work, his, his music was difficult. It was quite a lot of thinking about it. It was much, in many ways much more influenced by modern uh, ideas, mm. I think, and innovations than Britain's was. Um, but therefore, for that very reason, it was harder for a public audience, not forgetting the significance of the BBC, constantly extending the audience to music, um, who wanted something which was a bit more approachable than much of Tippett's work was. You, 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 we were talking earlier about, well, you started the, the lecture saying that British music, English music in particular, was sort of perceived as parochial, a backwater, you know, languishing in, in kind of parochialness. Um, and that Britain and Tippett changed all of that. Have they changed that forever? I mean, has that brought about a completely different international confidence in British music, in, in music of the British Isles, I'll put it that way. It's a very good question. And my, my inclination, but it'd be interesting to know what um, people in the audience think, is that it has. Um, I think that my, in a sense, showing that this was music that could reach far beyond the islands themselves, um, that was to break a convention which was deeply established, what I call the Darmstadt Convention that Britain was simply an irrelevant place which was devoted to sentimental music. If I can give one example which I find fascinating, it isn't mine, it came from one of the uh, books I've read about Britain, not one that's widely read. Um, it pointed out that, for example, Schumann, and to some extent Schubert, in their songs, use very simple, rather sentimental language. The great achievement of Britain was to and that, to a lesser extent, I think, of Tippett, was to actually leap to the most complex English and Scottish language and to actually manage to make the music fit those words. Uh, I'm told by a singer's friend, singer friend of mine that actually the, it, one of the hardest things to do is to actually sing difficult, uh, rather, uh, as it were, spiky English words in opera and that singing German or particularly Italian or mm -hmm. Spanish is very much easier. I don't know, I'm not a, I haven't been a singer for many years, but I, indeed I was only a singer in the Colchester Messiah chorus, if you want to know. <laughs> is there anything you haven't done? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't yes. do it, I was <laughs> strictly amateur. <laughs> but having said that, I think it is worth saying that, the, that I believe I'm right in saying that this challenge was overcome in the end, had been overcome by Purcell, was then overcome by Britain and others, and that, that essentially means that the challenge of English language has been approached, confronted, and I think largely overcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you, know, you wouldn't get the incredible John Adams operas without Britain having no, exactly. uh, legitimized right. English as a, a form of, of opera, yep. um, or obviously herself as. But the, the, the other thing that um, we talked about earlier, and I, I, I said that, I remember talking to Alex Ross when I first said, you know, can we stage your book? Uh, and at the time, I think he thought he w we meant one weekend. And, uh, and, but I asked him why Benjamin Britten like, was a chapter all by itself. Um, and he said, well, actually, it was partly stemmed from his guilt because he felt that um, he hadn't really been able to do justice to composers from the British Isles, but that was partly because he didn't really know what to say in their favor. And then all of a sudden, Britain was this phenomena, you know, that he felt he had to almost say, well, without a context, I'm just going to talk about Benjamin Britten, which he, which he does, doesn't he? He talks about him as, almost as a, as a soloist. Yes, that's right. Um, but he then goes on to, to suggest that Benjamin Britten became part of the establishment, lost his political fervor, um, sort of went off the boil politically, whilst you know, remaining fantastic in terms of his 
is composing. But you don't agree with that, do you? No, I don't agree with that at all. Um, I think given that in the last few years of his life, from about 1972 onwards, Britain was really quite a sick man, um, his resolute decision to support the appeals made by the pacifist movement, the attempts to try to deal with CND and so on, showed no sign of weakening. The weakening was physical, but there was no sign of intellectual or mental weakening. And there's one terribly touching story I have to tell, which I think is just touched upon by Alex Ross, which was that it's an amazing story, which was that Britain was actually working on the whole list on its have done. The very, he was about to write the fort, uh, Holy Sonnet of Dawn number 14, which begins, um, open my heart, three, three, three phased God. And that was, he was writing that the day before the explosion in Hiroshima, uh, which then happened the very next day. And when he, when he then later on learnt more about Hiroshima and the dropping of the nuclear weapon, the nuclear bomb, first time ever, he then discovered to his amazement that Robert, o Richard, Robert Oppenheimer, the inventor, or if you like, the major designer of the nuclear bomb, had called his first test Trinity, uh, the one that happened in the United States, after the very same poem, the 14th sonnet of Dunn, for the same sorts of reasons that had led Britain, who didn't know Oppenheimer, to use that as the basis of his own uh, statement against war. It was quite an extraordinary coincidence, and to this day I, don't, I can throw no light on it, but it looked like a kind of serendipity, the most incredible kind. Gosh, yes, that, that says something as well, doesn't it, about, about the need for poetry and the need for metaphor as yes. being the only thing that can summon up something which is almost uncontainable to the imagination. I think that's right, and I, think, I, I do think that the thing that makes Britain in many ways an immortal uh, was that he had this uh, ability to bring together poetry and music mm. in a quite incredible way. I mean, there are some great, great composers often don't, aren't very good with their librettos, so to speak, but Britain actually blended them two together, which was actually the key to understanding how to unlock creativity in these islands, I think. In other words, they had to be reached through literature because literature was the great expression of British art, rather than trying to read them directly through music initially. So it's very interesting if you go back far enough, of course, you run into the choral tradition. You run into the fact that in the Elizabethan Jacobean periods, a great deal of music is choral, I think I'm right in saying. In fact, madrigals and so on are dominant. Mm -hmm. So all the time in English art, or Scottish art as well, you get this marriage of the two in a way that isn't equally true, I think, of the great German composers or the great French composers. Okay, and now that's presumably given you long enough to think about burning questions. Um, so who would like to make a point or ask a question uh, and, and who's good at editing themselves so they're not too long? And I'm going to trust you up there with your hand up first of all. And anybody else with their hands up want to? And there's somebody up there next. So as soon as you get the microphone, begin. Okay. Uh, Shirley Williams, could I ask you about your, uh, the, what you know about the origin of uh, Benjamin Britten's pacifism, his, the personal origin of that? Some of it, I think, is from Frank Bridge, some of it perhaps from his schooling. Uh, where, where does that come from? And did you, uh, as a very young child, actually meet him with your mother's relationship uh, with, with him? If so, what did you make of him? Well, I think if you, it, I believe I'm right in saying, I mean, Michael Barclay would much more of an authority on this than I could ever hope to be, because obviously, Britain was a, a full grown up by the time I actually met him. But his pacifism, I think, goes right back to childhood. Um, he's supposed to have been taken by his nanny or some such person to see the changing of the guard and to find the whole thing absolutely unacceptable as a child in his seven or eight years old. In fact, in fi instead of finding the marching and the uniforms terribly attractive, he didn't like them at all. He was against, he didn't want to go and see them anymore. So this pacifism of his is very obviously very deep in his childhood, the childhood that he loved so much that he was in love with. Um, and I think that therefore one has to probably put it down, at least in part, to the influence of his mother. Though I don't know much about what um, Edith Britton thought in terms of 
the pacifism of the time. Uh, the other thing I think to say, which is important, is that he, he, he found, among many of his closest friends in the arts, other pacifists. Peter Pears was always a pacifist, Michael Tippett was a pacifist, and Britain was very close to them. He was obviously, as you all know, in many ways a rather reclusive man. Um, he, found it, he found it his great happiness to be moving among companions who loved music but also loved some of his political attitudes as well. Now, as for me, I was never a pacifist because my father wasn't, and I was more influenced by my father than my mother. But I remember as a, when I was a teenager, um, my mother wrote a pamphlet called uh, Seed of Chaos, which is after the words of Dryden, I think, um, which condemned the mass bombing of Germany. Uh, she didn't attempt to come out against the precision bombing of military targets in Germany, but when um, Arthur Harris uh, moved over to the mass bombing, the deliberate attempt to kill as many civilians as possible in order to break the morale of Germany, and you'll remember things like the huge air raids on Hamburg and Dresden and other places. Uh, my mother found that actually obscene, and she wrote this uh, pamphlet called Seed of Chaos, which was then published in the United States and in Britain. Again, bearing out my criticism of Alex Ross, it was very striking that here, the pamphlet sold about 30,000 copies and a few comments, and some people you know, said, this is very impressive, and all the rest of it. In the United States, it led to a complete explosion of anger, where my mother was accused of being a Quisling, a Nazi, everything else you could name, denounced by Franklin Roosevelt, denounced by Mrs. Roosevelt, denounced by a great many senators, and upheld by, to their great credit, uh, the leading figures of the Episcopalian Church in America, who were then in turn denounced by Roosevelt. So it led to a vast explosion of feeling, um, and I have to tell you a little secret, which pleases me greatly, which is that I've just had a letter from uh, a, a, somebody I don't know in Hamburg, who ha turns out to be the chairman of the uh, sort of arts committee of Hamburg, who's just written to me to tell me that the Great Canal in Hamburg is going to be named the Vera Britain Canal uh, after my mother. And that's given me a great pleasure. It would have given her a great deal of pleasure too. Uh, somebody up there? Um, I might be. Just correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard that when Benjamin Britten was born in Lowestoft, he was living in a house that actually overlooked the sea, and I'd been shown round it. Well, when, apparently when the First World War broke out, he saw all the ships and things bashing each other's eyes out, the dreadnoughts and so on, and then finally a zeppelin came and tried to smash the docks up at Lowestoft. And that was one reason, partly why I was a consensus objector. He didn't want to see this sort of thing happening through his life, and the sea was his life. And then when he was, under, when he was at the Royal College of Music, um, partly taught by Vaughan Williams, I mean, Vaughan Williams has got premonitions of the war and so on. This had partly an effect on him. Now, I might be wrong, but correct me if I... This, this is, as far as I know, this, this is what I read somewhere. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And while we're waiting for Sherry to answer that, anybody else want to ask a question? Raise your hand now so that we can get the microphone to you. There's somebody in the middle there, and there's somebody there. So if microphones can go to those two people. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I think as far as I know, you're right. I, I don't think I could um, confirm any other view. I think it is probably right. And it's worth um, remembering, and I think Alex Ross mentions this as well. You're quite right about the First World War that at that time, of course, what we now call the North Sea was known as the German Ocean. So that if you lived in Lowestoft, apart from the fact that Lowestoft was being steadily chewed up by the sea, like Dunwich and other parts of the East Coast, um, it was seen as being, in a way, the ocean that belonged to the German Empire. And so feelings in places like Lowestoft were somewhat stoked uh, by this view of what the sea was. And also, of course, by the fact that some of the earliest rather inefficient raids in the First World War um, from those great big air, air balloons uh, were on the East Coast. They weren't really effective and very few people were killed, but it was one of the earliest uh, aggressive actions against any part of the British Isles at that time. Okay, thank you. Somebody in the middle and then we'll come to the left. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Shirley Williams, during your talk, you just in passing there was some reference that suggested some parity between the second world war 
and the Vietnam War. There was something about a turn of phrase you used suggested an equivalence. Oh, yes, it did suggest. The, the phrase I used was that in some ways the, uh, I suppose the right way to put it probably is the, 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 the outrages of the Vietnam War were not altogether dissimilar to, well, probably in some ways to the First World War. Because when you think about the use of napalm and you then think about the gas use in the First World War, there is a kind of coming together of an acceptance of levels of horrible weaponry, which, oddly enough, we just in the last week decided are completely unacceptable and must be banned. Um, it's quite interesting, therefore, that there is an analogy, I think, between the savagery of the Vietnam War and of the First World War. In some ways, the Second World War, the savagery was perhaps much more marked in respect of, for example, things like saturation bombing than the use of chemical weapons, but that's what I had in mind. You, you talked about the fact that that uh, outrage in the USA of people feeling that they were coming out against the Vietnamese War, that, that, in, the, that in the UK, actually, it was perfectly acceptable to be against the, the war, yeah. but not in America at all. Well, to be fair, in America, what it was was divisive. I mean, I remember when I was wor working there, that you, you ran into colossal demonstrations against the Vietnam War. There was no question of the United States being accepting it, but the established figures, particularly the government at the time, um, accepted the idea of the Vietnam War. There was so-called domino theory. If Vietnam goes, then the whole of, the, of Asia will go. Very deep feeling that was held by many leading American thinkers at the time. But it's also fair to say that among young people, particularly among students, there was the most colossal opposition to the Vietnam War. The UK sailed along in its usual calm way, neither terribly pro nor terribly against. But um, Harold Wilson, who was always a very clever politician, uh, perceived that the Vietnam War would not go down well in this country, and therefore made it clear that he was against it. And managed somehow to rather brilliantly balance out Anglo-American relations, which never went, went, went bad over that, with the decision to keep Britain out. And he did it by the rather clever device of constantly sending peace embassies to Vietnam, none of which got anywhere as far as I could tell, but which enabled him to say at party conferences that Harold Davis or somebody else had just been sent to Vietnam, which calmed the conference. Um, but on the other hand, meant that he was never actually uh, forced to be involved in the war itself. It's quite a clever piece of chess. And it did have a rather useful attitude that we were never involved in the Vietnam War. Must remember that if it might come in useful. <laughs> um, okay, somebody there. Hello. Just to cover something that that we've been been talking about the origins of Britain's pacifism and that, I would like to recommend a film I saw quite recently, which you're showing this evening, called Peace and Conflict. It's um, a drama documentary by by Tony. Britain, who's uh, no relation, but it covers Britain's time at school in Norfolk mm. and the development and, for instance, the refusal to join the, um, the Cadet Corps and things like that. But it's a very interesting and um, worthwhile piece to watch. If you're here at, at um, 8 this evening, I, I would recommend you to sit and... That well, I'll that note film. that, thank you very much. And it's perhaps also worth buying at the Greshams, which is where Britain went to school in Norfolk. Um, it was also the school attended by Auden. So it, whatever faults it may have had as a school, it does seem to have been very good at fostering the creative instinct. I was interested in your point that Britain and um, Tippett changed the perception of British or English music outside, uh, outside this country. I mean, how it's seen internationally. Um, do you think that that perception, that changed perception, still exists now? And if so, with which composers would you particularly associate that change now, as in the beginning of the 21st century? Well, I'm, very, I'm struck, for example, by the way in which some of the very recent Scottish composers um, have been quite widely heard um, outside this country, Maxwell Davis and so on. And I think that it's, it's, it's one of the things that I do want to stress because it's a, it, it, this is, um, and the rest is noise, is partly about the interrelationship between music and politics, is that I think it would be very easy to underestimate the influence of, of Lord Pakenham, which is why I brought him in to mention it. Um, Pakenham was a very pious left-wing Catholic uh, 
uh, and therefore had quite close links to uh, the Christian Democrats in Germany as well as the Social Democrats. And because he was an adventurous man, I mean, it was quite striking when you think about it that someone like Yehudi Menuhin in Britain should be sent to Belsen within a month of the war ending, Britain already being known to be a pacifist. And it was the kind of thing that, that Pakenham was always prepared to take a risk on. He was prepared to put forward people whose views were not conventional, not the, not the establishment views at all. And in doing that, I think he brought to West Germany, as it then was, because most of West Germany was in the British zone, um, an extraordinary level of openness to the arts, openness to conversation and discussion, which actually had a marked effect on West Germany. So that by the time Adenauer comes to be the uh, leader of Germany in 1949, again early, you've already begun to get a completely different set of attitudes feeding into Germany, not just the disaster of the First World War, where people simply, as it were, threw Germany into reparations and then allowed her to sink, but a different set of attitudes which then became very popular in Germany, and to this day you get an internationalism in Germany which is quite surprising given her earlier history. I think Lord Longford Packenham deserves, uh, he's only remembered this country, I and mean, if you look up, it's sh shocking really, if you look up internet, what you get is Frank Packenham's support for Mary Hindley, the murderer. But he was actually a great man who, as he grew old, began to feel that he had to look after everybody, however evil they might be. And that now is the way he's remembered. But he was a much bigger man than that and a much more important figure in terms of the post-war world. Right. Sadly, we have to draw this to a close. I, I, I just wanted to mention, for those of you who hadn't, you know, the, the, the result of thinking about this could be that you might want to listen to Thomas Addis, who's, a, I, I think, now an international figure in terms of opera. You might want to listen to Mark Anthony Turnage, and you might want to listen to, of course, Judith Weir, one of our great female composers, James Macmillan, and George Benjamin, I think, now considered to be one of the world's great composers. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel confident that if Benjamin Britten, with Tippett, sort of struck out a new promontory uh, for music from the British Isles, that, that we've certainly kept it going, and that's just a few of the many, many names that one could refer to. Um, I haven't time to ask Shirley Williams whether it's too late for her to become Minister of Culture for Britain, Europe and the world, but it would be a good idea, wouldn't it? <laughs>